All right, uh, welcome everybody to the Extreme Event webinar, uh, Tips, Tricks, and Tales. Uh, my name is Carrie Stover, and I'm a program officer here at the National Academy of Sciences a public engagement program called LabX. Uh, my colleague Nell and I are going to start off with a uh, short presentation um, just to give you some background about the extreme event game, and then we're going to turn it over to our wonderful uh, guest speakers. Um, and also, I will remind you there is a chat function. So if at any point you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the chat box. We'll do a combination of answering them as we go along, and then we'll have a separate um, portion at the end uh, for the chat. Um, just give me one second here. All right, there we go. Uh, so like I said, my name is Carrie Stover. I've got Nell Nelson here with me. And then our three speakers today are going to be Karen McKenzie from the Science Museum of Virginia, Jenny Novak from the California Governor's Office of Emergency Services, and Tim Simpson from the uh, <clears throat> Southern Arizona Healthcare Volunteers, uh, the Medical Reserve Corps of Southern Arizona. So to give you a little bit of background on the extreme event game, um, it was developed using the analysis and recommendation from this 2012 National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine report. Um, and this report had a specific definition of the term resilience that you see up on your screen there. And it defined it as the ability to prepare, plan for, absorb, recover from, and more successfully adapt to actual or potential adverse events. Um, and what we saw is we realized there was a big interest from a lot of stakeholders in this report. And we were interested in trying to create a way to deliver this information to the general public that would be accessible and useful. So we worked with uh, staff from uh, the Resilient America Roundtable here at the academies who worked on the report, in addition to a science writer and a design firm in order to create the extreme event game. So the process that we went through with the extreme event game, like I said, started with the information from that disaster resilience report. And we looked at which aspects of the report we could feasibly communicate in a, in a game setting. Um, we held five different test events between 2013 and 2014. We did some in-person observations. Um, we distributed and analyzed uh, post-program surveys. Um, and we made iterative changes after each round based on the feedback we were getting and working with expert reviewers here at the academies. So the game, uh, you only need 12 people to play, but you can have up to 48, although we have scaled it up to 60 and we've heard from other organizations who have scaled it up to 100 plus so you can kind of once you know how the game works, you can really get a good idea of how to scale it up if you'd like. Um, it takes about an hour to play um, depending upon how uh, extensive you do at the end there's a discussion portion that can sometimes add a little bit of time. And while it was designed and recommended for ages 14 and up Nell and I have done it with groups as young as fifth grades so that's 10 and 11 year olds here uh, in the DC area and it has been worked into their curriculum so they have some background information before they play the game and it works really well and Nell's going to go into some of those examples shortly. We have three different disaster scenarios. We have a hurricane, flood, and earthquake. They all play out pretty much the same way with the same messaging. Just some of the challenges based on the disaster are different. And we have three different ways to play. You can do completely do it yourself, where you go to our website, download all the materials and print them out yourself. Um, you can request to borrow materials from us and we just charge you for the fee to FedEx them to and from your location. And then we do offer a fully facilitated experience where Nell and myself will come to you and your group and um, show you how the game plays. 
Another thing we really like to point out about the game is that it's not just a tabletop exercise and it's not an online game, but it combines elements of both to create kind of a multi-platform experience. You have your printed materials. You can opt to use our digital game portal. That's what you see um, on the iPad there in the image on the screen. Uh, there are sound effects, even if you don't use the digital game portal. And then there are additional slideshows you can use, which help to kind of give some atmosphere to the game. So some of the learning outcomes that were worked into the game and were um, part of that iterative development process that I talked about earlier, the two main ones are around critical thinking and civic literacy, um, where uh, the players are working together and negotiating for resources, they're considering relationships between the different sectors of the game, and they're communicating with others in order to solve different challenges. And what we also found is that players who had less prior knowledge to the topic say they learned a lot from playing the game, about resilience and then even those people who had prior knowledge say the game really reinforces their knowledge and they enjoyed playing it and then um, more anecdotally Nell and I have played with professional emergency managers and emergency responders and I think what it does is not only reinforce what they do on a day-to-day -day basis but helps them to kind of think outside their sector and um, reinforces this idea that to increase resilience, we need to collaborate across sectors. So now Nell is going to take over here. Okay, hi everybody. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the different groups that have played Extreme Event. So the game has proved to be really versatile, and we have played it with community groups, museums, school groups, emergency management staff, as well as humanitarian organizations. It can be used as a team building activity. Uh, it can be a kickoff activity for volunteer training, uh, an icebreaker, or part of a classroom unit. And on the next few slides, I'm going to highlight some of the different groups that we've worked with. No. All right, just one second. Okay, perfect. So here's a picture from when we facilitated the game for the Southwest Neighborhood Assembly. In DC, the southwest area is along the Anacostia and Potomac rivers, so it's very prone to flooding. We were invited to facilitate the game for the Southwest Neighborhood Assembly's Emergency Preparedness Task Force. And in the audience that day, it also included AmeriCorps volunteers, DC Homeland Security, and emergency management staff. In fall 2017, we hosted students from George Washington University's Freshman Day of Service. Uh, so unlike other service sites where freshmen help with cleanup projects or restorations, we thought this was a great opportunity to share with this super engaged audience that already is so community focused, the extreme event game. Uh, many of the students are already really active on campus. And so we wanted them to experience this game and think about how they could use it as a tool to talk about community resilience and disaster preparedness within the groups that they were really active in. This past fall, uh, we co-presented at the Association of Science Technology Centers Conference with the Science Museum of Virginia. I'm not gonna say too much about our presentation because you will be hearing from Karen, who was one of our co-presenters. Uh, but one of the things that we wanted to share with the museum professionals in the audience was the ways that this game could fit into their organization's public programming. Because all of the materials exist on our website for free and are available to download, we really wanted to highlight that. And something that Carrie and I say all the time now is, you don't need us to play this game. You can download it and do it all yourself. Great. Um, so in spring 2017, we worked with the executive emergency strategist for the Los Angeles Unified School District. Uh, we facilitated three rounds of extreme event earthquake for emergency management staff, city and county officials, Red Cross, LA Metro, first responders, and Homeland Security. 
we facilitated the game out at their emergency operations command center and you can actually see in the background of that picture the different maps on the walls uh, so it definitely added to the experience that made it feel very realistic and the last one that I want to highlight is the Asia Pacific Disaster Resilience Center. We were invited by the APDRC and the Korean Red Cross to facilitate the game at their Resilience Innovation Initiative in Seoul, South Korea. Uh, we played the game with stakeholders from about 10 different countries in Asia and in Europe. And what's really neat is uh, the Korean Red Cross is the first group that we've entered into a licensing agreement with them for, so they are actually going to be translating the earthquake game into Korean. So since March of 2016, we have had uh, that we've been able to count uh, more than 2,500 participants. So those include folks who have rented the game materials from us, um, groups we facilitated for, and then um, any time that a, a group lets us know that they have facilitated the game. Um, we've counted more than 35 cities, uh, six countries, and four continents that the game has been played on, which is pretty exciting for us. Um, not sure. Sorry, I'm just having a little issue with my screen here. But um, basically, we are going to now move on to our first presenter, and that is going to be uh, Karen McKenzie from the Science Museum of Virginia. So Karen, you can start sharing your screen. Okay. Let's see here. Success? Hopefully. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. Let me get my... There we go. All right. Um, as uh, Karen mentioned, my name is Karen McKenzie and I'm the Assistant Director of Education at the Science Museum of Virginia. Um, so we have used the extreme event game for approximately three years. Oh, am I, can you hear me? Okay. Um, so we've used the extreme event game for about three years now, um, and we did it in conjunction with a grant that we have from NOAA um, called, that we're calling Climate Connections. And what we're doing is focusing on all things climate change, basically, and how that affects us. Um, and so. We, our project had several objectives to it, and I'm not gonna read them to you, but you can see them on your screen. Um, but the, but the, primarily the point was to talk about climate change, um, what the effects are, and extreme weather events are some of the effects of climate change, and then how we need to be resilient. So the whole project was dealing with resilience and in, in, in regards to climate change. And so we have, um, as you can see, the three highlighted uh, lines up there, understanding what community resiliency is and why it's important, and then understanding how we as individuals can com um, contribute to our own resiliency of our community, and then um, not only com you know knowledge and then converting it into actually action, because without action, knowledge is really not very helpful. So, um, so these are the objectives that we were looking at. Um, and the extreme event game was really important. Now it was one piece in this bigger overlying project that we were working on, um, but community resiliency we found was just kind of a, almost a, for us a difficult topic to get uh, our hands around how to present. And so you can kind of look up some of the other program highlights that we had in conjunction with this grant. Um, there was the, piece about climate change and what's happening and why it's happening um, and things that can be done about it um, in terms of mitigation and things like that and the talking about the climate content. Um, and then outreach, um, how we're taking that information and reaching other people off site um, that are, have not self-selected to be a part of our program, whether it's media pieces on radio and that kind of thing. And then I'm going to skip going to individual resiliency. You know, we have different um, events that we have for resiliency, um, individual resilience being if there's, you know, a storm that's coming, how to, to have personal responsibility of having water, taking care of your pets, you know, things that you can do as individual, rain barrel workshops, things like that. And then there's the community resiliency piece, which is where um, the extreme event um, game, we call it the extreme event challenge, um, but the extreme event game can be very helpful. Um, and it really um, 
helped us to start the conversation about what we need to do as a community. Um, and then we would also do that with, um, with teachers. Um, so that was the other two big pieces that we did for community resiliency. So um, because we were focusing on climate change and resiliency as a, a cause and effect of climate change or necessary of climate change, um, we made things specifically for us. Um, so how do we make it ours? <clears throat> Our agenda, we wouldn't just do, I mean, as Carrie said, you know, the, it takes about an hour to do the program. We bolted it up and made it a kind of a more robust program. So we would obviously start with a welcome and, hey, why are you here? Thanks for coming. Sometimes we would take actually a, just a kind of a quick survey of, because our participants were, it was open to anybody, the public, whoever wanted to attend. We just, it was a free event because it was grant funded. We opened it to the public. Um, we actually provided um, adult beverages and, um, um, <clears throat> refreshments because we wanted to get as many people to come as possible. Um, and uh, so we would do a brief, brief program and then we would do a program called Science on Sphere. So Science on Sphere, you can see here, if you're not familiar with it, it's basically a three-dimensional platform that we have at our um, museum. It's a NASA NOAA product. It's basically a six-foot sphere that we project on. It's just a great way of presenting earth science um, um, topics. And so, you know, we would do a science on sphere program talking about climate change and why it contributes to more extreme um, weather events. Um, and then talk about resiliency because we're, we, we would talk about resiliency, what we found through, we did our own personal um, evaluation. And what we found is you just have to be explicit. Okay, we're gonna talk about resiliency. And then during the game, hey, we're doing, you know, we need to be resilient. And then afterwards we talk about, hey, what did we do that was resilient? How can we be more resilient? And just really kind of um, sadly just hammering it in. So, so we talked about that, made sure everybody knew what resiliency was so we could, we're all on the same page going forward. And then we did the extreme event challenge itself, the game itself. And then we would do, an, a, as I called it, the Virginia application debrief because you know we are a state agency. The Science People of Virginia is a state agency. So we really wanted to make sure that um, all the participants kind of looked at it and people also are more um, aware of it if it's you know um, a personal topic for them and although you know we said global warming for a while and then we now it's climate change but the fact and climate change is more apropos but global warming global is such a you know it's it's not us we need to look at local because local is what make people change behaviors um, so we it was really important for us to add that virginia application debrief at the end and I'll just put that on there. Yeah. Okay, so how we localized it. We we did a a uh, basically a slideshow afterwards showing some different topics. Um, you know, Tangier Island is one of, I mean, it was on the news not that long ago, actually. You know, the president went out there and said they shouldn't worry. We think they should worry. Um, but because they're just very low lying and um, you know, erosion, it's it's Terrible. So, but for Virginia, that's a big local topic. Tangier, also Norfolk Naval Shipyards, which is really, really low lying, and we're talking about billions and billions of infrastructure that um, they're trying to bulk up because it is in a, um, a perilous area on the coast. And so we talk about these things because it's really important. Our tax dollars um, doing these things, um, and so that's that's some of the topics that we bring up. And then recent extreme weather. Um, we started doing this a couple of years ago, you know, and, and sadly there are lots of examples of extreme weather and, and unseasonable weather. I mean, you know, we had snow last week, right? Strange. Um, so talk pulling in that, once again, that climate change for us and tying in into um, why this is important and why it's important to be resilient and, you know, community resilience, you're looking at Tangier and, and um, Norfolk and how important it is as communities with some other pot. Um, we are located in Richmond, Virginia, which is the capital of Virginia. And we have, um, you know, if you attended this in Virginia, in, in, you know, Richmond city, you would know these sites almost by, by, um, well, you would just by looking at it. Um, and so giving that perspective, that local perspective. Now we hadn't gone off site and done them, but if we did, the first thing I would do is take it and look at what 
um, the area I was going to and what are some local um, weather issues they have, low-lying areas, that kind of thing that might be prone. Because I forgot to mention, we did the, um, the flood the flood game. That was the one we chose. We did the low-tech flood game, which I should have mentioned. So some of the tips and tricks that um, we do um, is we prayer communicate with scientists. Sadly, not all scientists are great communicators. Um, that's why I think one reason that I, you know, science museums are great places, you know, they're hopefully we are all somewhat good communicators. And so we would um, present um, with a scientist and a communicator. So um, I would read the, you know, I would facilitate the game. And then if there were more technical questions that came up, um, we would have our scientists on. We have two, um, we're very lucky to have two um, um, PhDs that, you know, work on our site. And so they're there to answer any kind of really hardcore content question. And uh, apologists, if you will, for, um, um, for climate change, they're able to answer these, you know, more um, science heavy content just to make sure that we've got all of our ducks in a row. We want to make sure that we're not making more content, obviously. Obviously. The other thing we made, um, I just like to make it fun. I mean, making it fun. Um, so we would really do, you know, do silly things. Um, the two pictures on the left, we did it with actually middle school girls. Um, and as Carrie mentioned, you know, she, they recommended for 14 and up. Um, we had sixth grade to eighth grade. So, you know, 11 to 14 or 15 year olds. And it was just really interesting. Um, the only thing with that age group, we were definitely, um, you know, having to do a little bit um, more back up a little further in terms of um, um, prior knowledge because, you know, one young girl um, checked in and I gave her the name badge, which assigned her the role of FEMA director. And uh, she said, or, you know, but it's a federal, you know, emergency management administrator. And she's like, oh, so I don't know what that is, but it sounds really important. And so talking about those roles is really important because they didn't necessarily know what the roles of these folks should be. And quite honestly, not all adults do either. And so once again, those are good conversations that can come up. Um, and so really um, tips and tricks, you know, kind of try to get a good grasp of who your group is. Are they, are they experts in the field? I know that the two other speakers are, you know, did a lot with, um, you know, and um, um, LabX did a lot with um, professionals. Um, ours were more public, but then we did have some some professionals in there too. But so using their information and their knowledge, which was really great. So that was a kind of a whirlwind. Um, my once again, my name is Karen McKenzie. Here's my contact information if you have any questions. Um, but um, but yeah, we've we've used it like I said for about three years now, and we're going to continue to use it. After we got our feedback, um, we kind of like I said, we learned that we should really just hammer it in resiliency, resiliency, community resiliency what is it what does it look like what can you do and making sure you address it and address it and address it because um you know it, it people will remember it if you you know do it like that and and um sadly we have to hammer it in but it's important so um i think i'm going to guess turn it back to carrie here and please feel free to ask me questions if you have any Thanks, Karen. Um, so we're going to go over to Jenny Novak now. So Jenny, if you'd like to start up your presentation. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm just trying to share my screen here, but it looks like I need Karen to stop sharing first. Uh, we'll wait for that. So my name is Jenny Novak, and I'm an emergency services coordinator with the California Governor's Office of Emergency Services. Um, and in my current position, I work to support local level uh, emergency management organizations in um, development of their programs and providing any state resources that we can. There we go. Looks like I can share now. So can you guys see it now? I think so, yeah. Okay, good. All right, so um, I'm gonna speak though about uh, previous roles that I've actually used this uh, game or exercise. So I first learned about the extreme event exercise in 2015 and I immediately was super excited because I just love the concept of using fun, interactive, 
exercises and games to try to get people to understand a lot of the messaging that can can be construed as as just boring to some people, especially members of the general public who don't do emergency management or disaster preparedness on a day to day basis. So I just loved the idea of using this tool as a way to to spread some of our messages. So at the time, I was the emergency manager at Cal State University Northridge. So that's um, a large public school, a public university in uh, the Los Angeles area. So I was um, in charge of the emergency management program there. And I was also a volunteer with the American Red Cross Los Angeles region. And I used the game in both of those settings. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. Um, I should also know at the time, the earthquake game was not an option. I wish it had been at the time because it was, would have certainly been a much more applicable hazard because I did choose the coastal city um, version of the game at that time, uh, which is hurricane scenario. However, you know, the, the principles of resilience really do translate regardless of what the specific type of hazard is. So that's part of what I wanted to get across when I used this in these settings. So let's move to the next slide. Um, so the first time that I did the game, it was actually kind of the most overwhelming time because I decided to utilize it on a training that I needed to do for our resident advisors. So those are um, the students to, that are also um, like they work for the university as well as being a student in the dorms and they're in charge of a floor within our student housing there at CSUN. So there was about a hundred students um, of varying ages. So most mostly probably, you know, 18 to 22 ish um, that were a part of this training. And I think I had a, a total of uh, about three hours on their training to speak about emergency preparedness and emergency management. And I decided that I thought that this would be a really fun way to kind of get people moving to get them to think a little bit more creatively about this subject. So um, I actually, in order to accommodate 100 students, because as I think Carrie had mentioned, there is a 48 roles in the game. So I basically just doubled up on those roles. So um, we kind of ran sort of two versions of the game happening at once. Um, and I had uh, my, I was a facilitator, so I took the approach, I should say, with all of this of uh, downloading all of the materials myself and kind of putting this together and uh, learning the, the game myself and memorizing the script and enlisting help. Um, and that's definitely what was very much needed in this situation. The setting, it was a little bit difficult. Um, it was a, like a classroom style fixed setting, so stadium type seating, which is really not ideal on this. I would definitely recommend having a space where you can, you know, have tables and chairs and that you can make the room your own. Um, but it still went off really well and people really enjoyed the opportunity to use it as a sort of kind of icebreaker. And afterward, I went into a more traditional kind of emergency preparedness training for the resident advisors. So it was um, uh, kind of going in feet for head first into extreme events. So the next time that I did it was a lot better setting. This is our, our training room at my old um, university at Cal State Northridge. So we were able to move the tables around and create this kind of pod type setup, which is definitely um, recommended. Uh, and we were able to move those chairs and have our boards all around the room in a really kind of ideal setting. And I did this with two other groups on campus. So one of them was a group of uh, masters of public health students that was actually a student organization. So the student organization wanted to learn a little bit more about emergency preparedness. They uh, typically had meetings in the evening. So we organized organized a version of the game in the evening. So um, you can see the, the woman that's checking, uh, checking in students up there in the upper left-hand corner. She was my helper for this version of the game. I definitely always recommend having a helper if you're going to facilitate it yourself because there's a lot of moving pieces um, to the game. And then I also facilitated it for a group of nursing students. So they actually did the game during their normal class time, which is actually, it's really great, as Carrie mentioned, about an hour. So if the class is an hour long or an hour and a half, it, it, it's a perfect sort of exercise for that. It can fit really well into the curriculum, especially for that class. It was a nursing um, 
and uh, it had a focus on emergency medicine in that class. So emergency preparedness is a nice tie-in with that. And uh, again, I, I gave a brief presentation afterward about um, emergency management at Cal State Northridge and just kind of preparedness in general, which is a, it's, it's a good sort of tool to, to use as a transition into a more traditional presentation like that. And then I also um, held the game at several American Red Cross monthly volunteer meetings throughout the Los Angeles region. So I think it, we did that um, four times. So various settings there, I, I kind of just had to use whichever space was available for the typical meeting. And we had uh, varying sizes of groups for these different meetings. Um, I think most of them were right in the round, right around 20 participants or so, which is good. Um, and so that was interesting because this was a different audience. The previous audiences that I had worked with were mostly students at the university. So they had very little background in a, responding to an emergency for sure. And the Red Cross volunteers are, uh, these were the disaster volunteers. So they were really sort of embedded in this. And a lot of them have been in major disaster response operations before. So it was interesting to kind of juxtapose those two experiences and as was mentioned earlier the the game is really versatile in that it can um, be absorbed very well by people that have zero background in this um, because it, it gives them a chance to kind of see all the different roles of the community and how everybody plays a part um, but it's also really cool for those of us that are um, doing this as a day-to-day -day job or as volunteers that work in disaster because it does get you thinking outside of what your normal little piece of the community is and start thinking even more, even broader. So that was really successful as well. So overall, here's kind of some of the things I thought of that, that would help if you do want to use the approach of facilitating this for your own group. So downloading the DIY kind of um, approach rather than, or, or even if you rent the materials from um, the museum and have them send send you the materials. If you're going to self-facilitate, here are some of my recommendations. Definitely enlist a helper. Uh, it's It would be really, really hard to do this totally independently. And for all of these, I had help. And that person, um, they don't have to talk and be the facilitator like you do, but they, they do kind of support you when it's time to flip over the challenge boards or they need to collect uh, cards that, that they're discarding after that first phase of the game. So that's the resource. Um, phase where, where the groups have to decide on which resources to invest in. So the helper can, can definitely walk around and pick up some of those things for you, which is really great. I always printed out the script in advance and went over it myself. I would highlight a script for the helper so that they knew at, at what particular points within the game they needed to take a specific action. So we would go over that in advance. Um, from all of my different group sizes that I worked with, I recommend a group of about 25. I think that that creates creates sort of the perfect balance between having enough people in the room that, that there's a good energy, but not so many that it's just totally chaotic like it was with the first group that was like about 100. I think the smallest group that I did was 12 and it, it was sort of just a, a thinner group, you know, in the room that wasn't as many um, different people they could talk to. And so having over 20, 25, 30 people, I think is, is what you should shoot for. Definitely find a comfortable space that you can um, change to meet your specifications. I really like seeing what Virginia was doing with their own local photos in the room. That's an awesome idea. I wish I had had that idea because we could have done some really cool things with that at Northridge. Um, but definitely look for a space that you can um, manipulate. Wear comfortable shoes, definitely, because you will be moving around a lot as, as a facilitator and it's a very active game. A microphone can certainly be helpful for a larger audience. Um, I did use that when I had it with the RAs over 100 people, it really helped. And then I also recommend doing a test run with the audiovisual components. I did not use the um, electronic version of the game, so there's a choice where you could use iPads or laptops, but I did utilize the sound effects and the slide deck that um, can be projected in the background. But what I did find for that is that I needed to have a separate device for the audio than the visual because I can be playing the sounds at the same time as the slides going because it'll interrupt the slideshow. So I would play the sound, I think off my phone is what I ended up doing in most of them and then having a computer show the slide deck. So you know, that's another component to think about. 
and then a photographer it's it's awesome to have some photos later I don't have any photos of the first one I did with the RAs and I wish I did so I definitely would say uh, maybe your helper or somebody else can walk around and take some photos because it's so fun to, to have those to look back on later um, and then, yeah, just to underscore and really highlight some of the benefits that I, I felt um, having facilitated this seven or eight times. It's definitely a great exercise for team building, ice breaking. It's, it's an opportunity because it really gets people mixing. They're in one group at the beginning of the game and another group toward the middle part of the game. So, and then there's a lot of, um, you know, kind of bartering back and forth in the middle of the game, which gets people to talk to each other, which, which can be really important. Sometimes it's not easy. And it, also um, the way that you assign the roles, if a group of people come in together, like three or four students who are friends, um, they're, they're going to get assigned to different tables. So that helps to break up the crowd and to make sure that, that they're meeting new people. And definitely critical thinking about preparedness and resilience, um, especially for audiences that are less familiar. It's, it's a great way to do that in a fun and interactive environment. So, you know, any community groups that you can think of, students in K through 12, probably not K, but you know, the older age groups, I think it would work really well with that. Um, disaster psychology. So it was really, really fascinating for me and all of the different times that I did this game to see which groups um, kind of there was sort of two sides of that coin where a lot of groups, they would want to help each other and they were willing to give up whatever resources that they had to kind of help the community. But then you definitely also saw other groups where they would want to hold on to their resources and they would want to hoard those cards in case they needed them later and they didn't want to um, necessarily help another group. So. Um, it was really, really interesting to kind of see those dynamics. Um, and then overall, it's, it's a great reinforcer of just a whole community approach to emergency preparedness and resilience um, and really examining how those neighborhood level connections can um, really help you later on. So, you know, a lot of it's about the relationships that are built in the beginning part of the game because later um, when they have to mix up um, what group they're with, they, they met somebody in that earlier group group and they're able to kind of use those relationships to try to help them solve their challenges later on in the game, which I think is a really great example of what we should be doing as communities overall um, to support resilience across the nation, across the world. And then the biggest benefit really is having fun. I, I can't stress that enough that I think this is just a fun way to talk about this subject. And um, I'm really a huge proponent of these interactive type of preparedness. Um, education events. I've definitely done quite a few of them and I think this is really an excellent one. Um, and I also want to give you guys my contact info. So this is being recorded. Feel free to reach out, especially I know Carrie had mentioned there's a lot of people in California that were listening in. Um, if there's anything I can do to help support you um, trying to bring this game to somewhere in Southern California, please let me know. I would love to, to give you, um, you know, tailored feedback. I also have on my website a couple other um, interactive activities, an escape room and a scavenger hunt that I created while I was at CSUN. So if you're interested in other options like that, check out my website. So with that, I want to hand it over to um, my next colleague. All right, so next is uh, Tim Simpson. So Tim, if you want to go ahead and start sharing your screen. Great. Okay. So once again, good morning, everyone from the desert in, in Tucson. Um, my name is Tim Simpson. I'm the executive director of the Medical Reserve Corps of Southern Arizona. We're uh, a group of, of medical volunteers, medical professionals. Our particular Medical Reserve Corps is made up of physicians, nurses, pharmacists, and behavioral health professionals serving all of Southern Arizona. Our particular group was established in 2002. We were one of the first uh, groups as a demonstration project for the Medical Reserve Corps National Organization and have been in existence since that time, with currently about 350 to 400 active members of all those professions. And uh, 
across the country and across the, uh, the US, there are more than 900 units currently in all 50 states and territories with about 200,000 volunteers. So I think for most people, we're one of the, the largest, least known uh, volunteer groups in the country at this point, but we're trying to spread the word. And what do we do? Uh, our particular goals are, are really three. We do emergency and disaster response and recovery throughout the community. We do community outreach and education, and also are involved on a daily basis, particularly with our public health department here and non-emergent public health events of all kinds. And uh, our particular involvement with the extreme event has been using all three of the scenarios. We started like the other presenters with the first option, which was the coastal storms, uh, and then transitioned to flooding and earthquake as those became available. And uh, obviously because of where we are in the, the desert, the flooding was the most appropriate one for our particular locale. We're seldom uh, concerned about hurricanes and coastal storms. And uh, fortunately, we have less experience with earthquakes than our, our neighbors on the West Coast. So we've used flooding the most, but we have used all three scenarios. And as you can see in the photo here, uh, this particular event was uh, a couple of years ago at a conference in Phoenix. And this was uh, the earthquake scenario with the fault line running down the middle of the conference room. Our audience has been uh, our own medical professionals from our, our MRC organization. We also do the, conduct this on a regular basis with College of Nursing students from the university here in, in Tucson. Uh, high school students with the JTED program. JTED is the Joint Technical Education District. And we've used this for both students in uh, the EMT paramedic program as high school students and also their healthcare uh, training program for high school students. We also worked with HOSA uh, extensively. HOSA, the uh, Future Healthcare Professionals is an international organization of primarily high school students, but also students from universities um, with career tracks in um, healthcare. And this particular photo again, and the photos that you're going to see are all from the uh, most recent conference that we used the uh, extreme event at their annual conference in Phoenix. Uh, that conference attracts between 2,500 and 3,000 high school students from across the state every year. And uh, this, is, this is one of those that we did. Good suggestion that you heard with the previous presenter is that uh, if you have someone who can do photos for you, that's terrific. This is the one um, particular event where I wasn't facilitating. And so I got to take photos at this event and it's the only one that we have photos from. The other thing that we've done with this is school district staff. And uh, we focused a lot on emergency preparedness and response with uh, our local school districts, including everything from active shooter training on through uh, the Stop the Bleed program. And this is another, um, what we felt was an important component of training that we could do as community outreach. So how does it work? You've already heard a lot of this and I'm going to run through this quickly and reiterate some of what you already heard. It's a wonderful hands-on experience. We found that it's extremely adaptable for groups of all different ages and uh, backgrounds and educations all the way from the HOSA groups where they were incorporating middle school students through high school and, uh, and college students to our own medical professionals. Um, a multidisciplinary multi group, um, we've worked with doctors and nurses and pharmacists and people from different professional backgrounds, put them together in the same room and made them think and work together, which is not always the easiest thing to do. Um, there are no re real, real prerequisites for it. Um, as you've heard before, um, our high school students were uh, always challenged, I think, by some of the, the technical terms and some of the uh, tasks that they were being asked to do. And so it takes a little more explanation, a little more time and some backgrounding for them. Um, and all training levels and experience, it works for everyone if you take the time to make it work. And what we've learned out of this, I think one of the biggest lessons that our, our users, as well as uh, those of us who are presenters have learned, 
is that it's great to, to learn and experience collaboration and cooperation, which is always one of the things that we find in any time we're doing any kind of training or actual emergency response is that people really need to know and understand that there's this, this real need for co collaboration, cooperation, and the third C should be communication. Um, it also does a lot for um, critical thinking skills. Decision making is obvious because you have to make uh, some split second decisions when you're given a certain part of the scenario to say, okay, so this has happened, now what do you do? And it's great to throw things in on the fly for people and say, yeah, you think you've got this solved, but now here's, here's something that's just happened that is going to change your whole attitude about what's, what's happening in your community. Learn a lot about resource management. And you heard with the pre previous presenter that uh, there were some groups that were being very uh, protective of their resources and others who were extremely willing to share. And you kind of have to see if you can work a, a good medium between the two to say, yes, well, you need to do that. But if these folks need it, it's for the good of the community. And then prioritization, of course, to say, okay, what are our three or four most important things that we we need to do to, to make this work for the community at large. Um, and lastly, hands-on experience. Obviously, it's really important to say, yes, this is something that we do as a hands-on. And here's just a brief video for you. I think there's really nothing more interactive than, than hiding under a table during an earthquake with a group of people who you've never met before. So um, use those kinds of tools, use them well. We've done this experience with our own printed materials. We've done it with um, the complete package from um, the extreme event where they've provided all of the materials for us. We've done it with uh, iPads, we've done without. There was even one situation where I thought I was going to have internet connectivity where I didn't. And so on the fly, we had to cover for all the things like all the videos and all the sounds and all the, the visuals that are, are normally part of the presentation and make it happen. And that was you know, another learning experience for all of us, including the, the participants to say, okay, so things generally should happen the way you want them to, but they don't always. And so you need to be ready for just about anything with any kind of an emergency, including your systems not working the way you want them to when you're doing the presentation. And lastly, um, you're certainly welcome to contact me with any questions on anything that, uh, that you've seen or heard. Here's my phone number, our, our email address, and uh, greetings from Tucson. All right, Tim, thank you so much. And thank you also to Karen and Jenny for your wonderful presentations. Uh, we're gonna open it up for questions now. I know some of you have been asking questions along the way. And then I'm also going to um, put up the contact us slide that I was not able to show you earlier. There we go. So there um, is my email address, Nell's email address, uh, the website for the Extreme Event Game where you can find all the information, including materials. We also have a short four minute um, video, which will give you a better idea of gameplay um, and also uh, our social media. So we're on Facebook, uh, Twitter, and Instagram at, at @labxnas. And if anyone does decide to do your own game, we really encourage you to take pictures and videos and share them with us on social media using the hashtag extreme event game. 
So if anybody um, has any questions, you can see the chat room because I can't. All right, can you hear me? Oh, yes, go ahead. Uh, yeah, Chris Philippat in Oakland, California. Um, I'm looking at the uh, types of exercises you're running, and they are very, they're really interesting, but they're, they're also highly visual. And I am wondering if you all have ever considered um, the, the latest uh, hot technologies of uh, augmented in particular, or possibly even virtual reality uh, as an addition to, you know, give people a real feel for what these extreme events can be like and, and, how, and how to help people. Um, that's a really great question. It's not something that we've considered. Um, we have talked a little bit about whether or not we could make the extreme event game something that would take place fully online. Um, but in that respect, the game really works because people are in the same room together talking and interacting. Mm -hmm. um, I will say that we're also in the process of um, we're going to do a summative evaluation of the game and um, see what sort of effects gameplay are having on participants and then mm -hmm. we'll use that information to um, kind of strategize with the extreme event game moving forward. So it's definitely something that we could keep in mind. Thank you. It was kind of a brainstorming question. So I just want to suggest one other thing, which is that uh, perhaps certain elements of it could be made available uh, prior to the game, because I appreciate that having human beings in the room with you and interacting with them is the key objective. But if everyone has sort of a grounding in, in the elements, uh, I, I would love to be in touch with you about that. Sure. Um, yeah, feel free to send Nell or I an email. That'd be great. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Nell is also answering questions that are being typed into the chat. Um, does anyone else have any questions that they'd like to um, say out loud instead of typing them? Does the digital platform work on Chromebooks? Yes, it does. Excellent. Yep, all the uh, tech requirements are also in the game materials that can be found on the website. Sure, um, Rudy asked, uh, any advice on briefing people about the roles? How do you explain what the FEMA manager does, for instance? Um, what we've never kind of gone through each role individually prior to gameplay. What we do is we judge based on the audience that we're working with. And um, in the first portion of the game, what you do is you ask people to introduce themselves to the players at their table from the perspective of the character on their name tag. And then what Nell and I will do is we will go around the room from table to table and just ask, you know, does everyone understand what their role means um, and have a conversation like that. So, you know, depending upon who my audience is, I'm going to explain what the FEMA director does differently to a fifth grader that I might maybe to, you know, an older um, adult who maybe doesn't know what FEMA is. So it's really about making it um, specialized to whatever audience that you're working with. Okay. Anybody else? All right, well, if no one else has any questions, I will just thank you all so much for joining us. And once again, thank you to uh, all three of our presenters. Um, thank you for being champions of the extreme event game. I hope everyone listening um, goes to the website to learn more or send Nell or I an email. We would love to hear from you and love to work with you and help you in any way we can in bringing the extreme event game to your group or your community. So uh, thank you once again and um, have a great day.